Hi everyone and welcome back to my breakout code along where we will be making a breakout game in Godot 4.2. In this video we will be using GDescript but I also have a C sharp version if you prefer that. You can find a link to it in the description for this video. The first thing we will be adding to the game is the player paddle and that is what this video is about. And now let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I did was to create a scene for the level and also one for the paddle. I want our paddle to be a character body 2D node and it then also needs a sprite and a collision shape. As I mentioned the last time, I will be making a breakout game using some of the free platformer art from Kenny. You can use whatever you like, of course. For now, I have just set the shape of the collision shape to be a rectangle, but we might change this in later episodes. In the last episode, I gave you a lot of questions to think about when we designed the paddle for the game. We talked about who the ideal player of the game would be and how the game should be played. For my game, I've chosen that, well, someone like myself is my ideal player. Most of the time, I play games on my laptop while I sit on either a couch or a comfortable chair. And with kids, work, a garden, a house and so on, I mainly just play short sessions. So how does this affect how the game is played? Well, I usually can't really use a mouse when I sit on the couch. And I also think that the trackpad on my laptop is impossible to use for gaming if you have to use it all the time. Like to move the paddle in a breakout game. So input from the mouse is out. But keyboard input is fine. So that is what I'm going for. And I definitely prefer using... W, A, S, D keys over the arrow keys for something like this. So in the input map settings, I have added the W, A, S, D keys to the UI left, right, up and down actions. To move the paddle, I've added a script to the paddle scene's root node. Here I have a physics process function and an exported variable called speed. In the physics process function, I then first set the character body's velocity vector to zero, and then either decrease or increase the X part if the UI left or UI right key is pressed. To move the paddle, I then use the move and collide function with the velocity multiplied with delta and the speed. Before we test how this works, I add an instance of the paddle to the level scene and place it correctly. And in the project settings, I have set the size of the viewport to 920 times 1080 and the stretch mode to canvas item and the aspect to keep. So the level will always look the same even if we resize the window. Now the player can move the paddle using the keyboard. The next thing is to decide how and where the paddle moves. In most breakout games the paddle movement is bound to the screen and has no vertical movement. And this is also what I started out with. You can keep the paddle from moving outside the screen in a number of ways. I prefer to do it using walls. Later on, I can then use these walls if I need to restrict the movement of either the paddle or the ball in other parts of the game. Okay, so for my wall scene, I've chosen that the root node should be a static body 2D. We won't be moving these walls at all once the game is running. And this scene also has a sprite node and a collision shape. 
The art I've chosen for my walls is actually just a square, but the walls might be all kinds of sizes, and I want to make it really easy for me to change the size of a wall later on. In the level scene, I want to be able to resize the wall, and then have the sprite texture repeat itself automatically. So it should look something like this. This proved to be a bit more complicated than first anticipated, but I found a nice little solution anyways. At first, when I resize the wall, the sprite texture is just stretched. In the wall scene, we can select the sprite and enable texture repeat, and also enable region. Now let's see what happens when we set the width and the height of the region to something larger than what the texture actually is. The box texture I'm using is 70 by 70 pixels. So I just test the texture repeat by setting the width and the height to 140. This will repeat the texture. However, now the collision shape doesn't match up. But that's okay for now. We will fix this later by scaling the sprite. I created a script for the wall scene, and at the top of the script, I have specified that this should be a tool. This way, we can see changes in the editor instead of having to wait until we run the project. We also have an unready variable to store a reference to the wall's sprite, and finally, we have a ready function. I used the ready function to change how the sprite looks based on how the root node is scaled. The total size of the wall is the size of the sprite multiplied by the wall's scale. This is then what I set the size of the sprite's region rectangle to. Remember that the sprite wouldn't match with the collision shape if we only changed the region? I fixed this at the last line here, where I divide the sprite's scale with the root node's scale. Now when we scale a wall, the sprite will automatically be updated correctly. We can see this when we run the game. But we can also see it directly in the editor because we've made the script a tool. If you don't see it updating right away, then try look at another scene and save this and then go back to the level scene again. Then the wall should update correctly. To restrict the paddle movement, I then finally added a wall to the left and to the right of the screen. If you want the paddle to be able to move a bit up and down as well, then you can set the paddle's velocity using the input.getVector function, and then move using move and slide instead of move and collide. If you use the move and slide function to move the paddle, then remember to multiply the velocity with the speed. You don't need the delta value here. We can then use invisible walls to restrict the movement in the up and down direction. It can be a good idea to place this wall on another collision layer, so that the ball doesn't hit them later on. And then of course, we also have to remember to add this new layer to the paddle's collision mask. I won't be adding vertical movement like this to my game, but you can of course. However, I do want the paddle to be able to jump. I'm not sure yet if this should be enabled from the start or by some kind of pickup, but I think it's a fun addition to the paddle movement. To make the paddle jump, I have added a new jump action to the input map and assigned it to the space key. In the script, I have added two new exported variables, one for the jump impulse and one for the gravity. The ready function now has both a few changes and a few new things. First, I only reset the horizontal part of the velocity each time the function is called. The vertical part 
needs to change gradually when we jump, so we can't just set it to zero every frame. To see if we should jump, we use the isOnFloor function to check if the paddle collided with the floor the last time it was moved using the move and slide function. You can read more about this function in the documentation. And of course I've left a link to where you can find it in the description to this video. If the paddle is on the floor and we've just pressed the jump action, then we subtract the jump impulse from the vertical velocity. If, however, the paddle isn't on the floor, then we decrease the vertical velocity by the gravity times delta, which is the time passed since the last frame. Try to experiment with jumping if you want to add this to your game. Change the jump impulse, the speed and the gravity to get a good feeling of how they impact the paddle's movement and what you think is the most fun. The final thing I will add to my panel movement right now is a bit of friction. When I did this, I also refactored the code into a few functions to make everything easier to maintain. For the friction, I added two new exported variables, friction x and limit x. I also have a direction x variable to store what direction the player wants to move the paddle in. Instead of setting the horizontal velocity to zero before we handle input, we then just set the direction x to zero and update this variable if a key is pressed. In a new apply friction function, I then reduce the horizontal velocity if no input was given, and the paddle is moving. If the player pressed a movement key and the direction x variable thus isn't zero, I then set the velocity as before. Finally, if the absolute value of the horizontal velocity is lower than the limit, then I just set it to zero. And that is basically how I made my paddle move. The next step will be to add a ball to the game. The ball should of course be moving and bouncing off either some walls, the border of the screen or something similar. It's completely up to you. But the most interesting design choice is how the ball will act when it hits the paddle. Will the ball always be perfectly reflected or Will how the ball bounces depend on where on the paddle it hits? Will it always bounce only in the vertical direction? Or will it sometimes also bounce back in the horizontal direction? Consider trying out a few things and see how they feel. What seems the most fun? How will the interaction affect the rest of the game? What feels fun? You can add a lot of fun things to your breakout game later on. But if you can make the basic movements and interactions fun in themselves, then you have a very good foundation for a fun game. I highly recommend you give it your best shot before looking ahead for my solutions. Also, if you're following this code along, please consider joining the Megatech Discord channel and share your progress. In the next episode, I will be sharing how the ball in my breakout game works and why I chose to make it like that. I might also add a few hints to how it can be done differently. Have fun coding! Bye!